What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to Studs and Duds, the most comprehensive NFL player review series on the internet. My name is Marcus Whitman, and today we're going to be going game by game, recapping the risers and fallers from NFL weeks eight and nine. If you are new here, you should know that as we go, you will be seeing ratings adjustments to these players. And these ratings adjustments actually stem from my own custom Madden roster update, something I've been doing since 2016. But have no fear, I've watched all of the games up to this point, reviewed the film from last week, and you can be rest assured to know that these ratings changes do accurately show how I perceive these players in real life. Beyond that, if you enjoy, please do hit that like button down below. Really helps me out, helps support and grow the channel. Also, this is my most ambitious endeavor every week, putting this video out. So if you enjoy, if you learn something, if you wanna support the series, you can do it through these links right here. You can support directly via Venmo or PayPal or sign up on patreon.com slash that franchise guy where you will also get exclusive content such as film breakdowns and access to my weekly NFL picks. So without further ado, let's get into the star of the week. And this week's star is Miles Garrett as yet again, just taking over football games from that edge rush position, a truly unique specimen that has fully crafted his game with power and finesse to the point where I do think he has at least matched that of the impact of Aaron Donald, who I actually consider to be one of the best defensive players, if not the best of all time. So I don't say that lightly. Miles Garrett goes now from number 95 to 99 overall for me, truly at the top of his powers and at the top of the game defensively, just week after week, wrecking defensive game plans, changing the numbers for offensive blocking schemes. If you leave this man one-on-one, -on -one, he's gonna make you pay for it. And he's done it week after week after week. I think he only has like one week where he doesn't actually have a sack. He's on pace for record numbers. It's been truly special and really fun to watch. Miles Garrett, who we all knew had this potential, but now reaching the potential of potentially being the best defensive player in the NFL. So hats off to Miles Garrett and what he's accomplished for the Cleveland Browns and that defense. Now the dud of the week, another defensive player, and it's going to be Trayvon Diggs, who quite frankly, might be the most overrated player in the NFL currently. And that's obviously going to come off as a shot at Trayvon Diggs. That's not really my intention here. The point I'm trying to make here is that stats way more often than not do lead to players actually becoming incredibly overrated. And I'm talking about raw stats, in this case being interception numbers to the point where Trayvon Diggs did come out the gate and had seven interceptions and a lot of them were really good plays and I'm not trying to say Trayvon Diggs is terrible or that he can't play or that he needs to come off the field that's not the case he's risen a lot in these videos throughout the season he has really at least emerged as a high-end starter at the cornerback position but but the last couple of weeks Trayvon Diggs has really been exposed as a player that doesn't have that high-end coverage ability at the cornerback position he has incredible ball skills which are something he deserves credit for and has received plenty of credit for. Look at any article written about the Cowboys this year. But if you have seven interceptions, that's great. But if you're giving up tons of yardage and coverage, in Trayvon Diggs' case, towards the top of the league and the bottom five as far as yardage allowed, a literal point of emphasis in the passing games of teams like Minnesota and Denver over the last couple of weeks, giving up big plays, giving up touchdowns, uh, penalties, holding players, and, and arriving early. Uh, look at that slant in the end zone where he was flagged, showing up early, getting a little too aggressive. Very much a polarizing player, Trayvon Diggs. I do believe he is one of the more overrated players in the NFL currently because of those raw interception numbers. He deserves credit for his ability to create turnovers and bait quarterbacks for sure. But if you just look at a snap-to-snap -snap basis, Trayvon Diggs is not nearly this alpha number one corner that the media and a lot of Cowboys fans would lead you to believe. So Trayvon Diggs just coming down one overall because he has had an impressive season on the season. Uh, but 
a little bit of a pump the brakes moment as well for Trayvon Diggs, who's really come back to earth and not creating those interceptions either. So let's get into the team by team breakdowns here, weeks eight and nine in the woodworks here. So the Chicago Bears, we're going to be starting alphabetically. Da Bears, Justin Fields, man, showing why he was such a hyped up prospect and delivering on some of that hype. You look at the play extension against the Niners, you look at some of the balls uh, that he's been able to deliver down the field, big time throws galore, settling in as far as his understanding against the blitz that was an issue for him in his first few starts, looking much more composed under pressure and able that has led him to be able to use that arm talent and the accuracy and the mobility much better. So it hasn't been perfect for Justin Fields, but this is basically everything you could have asked for for the Bears is to see Justin Fields flash the brilliance that he's capable of, but also show the week-to-week development and weed out some of the weaknesses that he did have early on. He actually lowered uh, his, uh, I lowered his overall several weeks ago. Now he's getting uh, not just that one overall back, but two more uh, to boot. So Justin Fields, lots of optimism for the Bears for the future. They do seem at this point in time like they have hit on Justin Fields, assuming he continues to grow then these receivers stepping up as well. These res- these Bears have a lot of speed that Justin Fields can utilize here. Darnell Mooney, Marquise Goodwin, both players making plays down the field. Good to see some depth and potential options there with Allen Robinson's contract looming. The offensive line is also, I think, contributing to Fields playing a little better as well. It was well documented how much that right tackle position especially was suffering. But getting Larry Borum a mid-round, I think fifth-round rookie that I actually really liked. I was higher on Larry Borum coming out. I think I had a third to a fourth on him, but him coming back healthy, stepping in at right tackle and and holding his own. You know, the expectations are low, but he's been better than what they've had there. And Jason Peters continues to, I think, get in football shape, handle speed better, and look more and more like his old self. He's actually playing really well. So with the Bears getting some stability, at that tackle position. And I know Tevin Jenkins as well could potentially be coming back this season, which could really be exciting at that right tackle position. He's a prospect that myself and many liked, but you get some receivers playing better, some tackles playing better, the talent in general, much more supportive for Justin Fields right now. And everything's looking a little bit better offensively after being one of the worst in the league for the beginning of the season. Then in the defense, uh, on the defense, in the secondary, Duke Shelley, young slot corner, continues to get more and more playing time, showing that scrappiness that he did at Kansas State in the slot. And then DeAndre Houston Carson for the third straight episode in a row, going up, making the most of that opportunity to get starting reps at safety after he's been buried on that depth chart for years. But an interesting player that could be having a late career emergence as a starting caliber versatile safety in that quarters heavy Bears defense. Okay, next up the Cincinnati Bengals. A couple of rough weeks in a row for the Bengals. Jackson Carmen, the rookie right guard, doing a good job in the run block game, but as a pass protector has been kind of the lone liability. The center there, Hopkins, not playing great either, but that has been a a clear weak link on the offensive line is pressure coming through Jackson Carmen's way. So he's got a lot of development to do as a second round pick, a converted tackle out of Clemson. And then Logan Wilson, just as we really hype him up the last few weeks, he's been skyrocketing in this series, but the last couple weeks showing up in the missed tackle column, not making the same plays in coverage, just a little bit of pump the brakes for the young linebacker that I still think has a very a positive future, but some disappointing performances to follow up a really hot start to his season. Now for the Buffalo Bills on the defense really is going to be some boosts for Gregory Rousseau, the rookie edge defender, just showing off the size and physicality to become a part of that rotation. I've been a plus run defender, which his tape indicated he was going to be able to do right away. And he's been able to get some pressure for this Bills defense. It hasn't been electric or anything, but he's continuing to be a pleasant surprise 
for a rookie that many thought was really just not going to contribute much early on. And he's been just that, a contributor to this defense. Then Levi Wallace, he's just been very sound this season. And sometimes that's all you can ask for, especially from a number two cornerback, is don't stand out. Don't get obliterated every week. Recognize that, yeah, he's, he's going to have some losses out there. But in this system, he's really settled in. Uh, smart player with some length and deserves some credit. Then we've got the kicker, Tyler Bass, AFC Special Teams Player of the Week, moving up for the Buffalo Bills. Okay, the Denver Broncos, lots of movement now. Uh, starting on the offensive side of the ball, Teddy Bridgewater, an outstanding outing against the Dallas Cowboys, one of the better quarterback performances uh, uh, on the week as a whole around the NFL. Showing some velocity playing in an indoor stadium. And his pocket movement, his ability to sense pressure and extend plays inside the pocket is so impressive. So when he's accurately throwing the ball downfield, Teddy Bridgewater is a quality starter, quarter, uh, quality starting quarterback. The problem is that week-to-week -week consistency from Teddy Bridgewater. Risers on the offensive line across the board uh, in a variety of different players. Bobby Massey, the veteran right tackle, is settling in there. Lloyd Cushenberry continues his impressive season, persevering through the team, uh, making efforts to potentially replace him after a down rookie season with Quinn Miners coming in, another third round pick. But Lloyd Cushenberry has fit the test and week after week shown that he is at least a solid center for the Broncos. And then Calvin Anderson in his return to Texas, he was, I believe, an undrafted pickup. I do remember having a draftable grade on Calvin Anderson, a kind of fluid athlete at the tackle position who needed to add some strength and play strength to his ability and pass protection, but seems to have done that as he gets the start at left tackle with no Garrett Bowles this week and really doesn't miss a beat. A really impressive job against Randy Gregory and a Dallas edge group that's nothing to scoff at. Uh, so plus five for Calvin Anderson showing that he there could be something there. Uh, if nothing else, maybe a nice rotational, uh, not even rotational, but just a good depth piece. Kendall Hinton, one of the more underrated stories on the season. The man's an athlete. He can separate. He's got good ball skills. He was kind of a, a folk legend for getting that start at quarterback last year, but that's behind him now. Now we can start talking about Kendall Hinton, the receiver, who seems to be kind of a good undrafted find who's done a great job to earn playing time here despite the amount of talent that Denver kind of has. You, know, you can look down the board. He's beaten out a lot of guys with, with you know, chances here. Guys like Seth Williams, a talented late round pick. They've brought in John Brown. They brought in uh, David Moore. But it, it's Kendall Hinton that has beaten those guys out, and he's produced when they've called his number. So it's not just a meme, Kendall Hinton. He's a legit athlete and an undrafted find for the Broncos who seems to make a big play every week. Uh, so a fan favorite, I'm sure, for the Denver Broncos, as is Tim Patrick, who you can say similar things about. Uh, Tim Patrick has had every reason in the world to get passed up by other players of higher draft and investment pedigree. But Patrick is big. He's six foot five. He can legit run. He's not a burner, but he can stack on the outside. He's got great hands. He has evolved this year with his ability to uh, be an impact in the middle of the field as well uh, in the intermediate game. So Tim Patrick, an impending free agent, probably going to cash out in the market this season. Uh, then we've got tight end, a couple of tight ends, Eric Saubert, who just week after week blocking his absolute ass off. And you've got to appreciate that for a guy, you know, he's, he's one of these roster bubble guys and he's got value to this team as that third tight end that's going to come in and block because you know Noah Fant's not going to do that for you. So Eric Sobert will. Albert Akwegbunam. Ooh, man, he is intriguing. He is, you know, when the Broncos drafted him, it was like, wow, that's cool. They added another ultra athlete to this team that doesn't have a quarterback. Great. We're never going to see him emerge because when's he going to play? Well, he's playing and he's playing at a high level. This dude is a freak, man. He's 6'5", 255 pounds, 4'5", speed. And to see him come out and actually block and show that effort and consistency that really wasn't always there at Missouri, to be completely honest. 
he has a very high upside if he continues to develop and get good coaching here for Denver. In the last couple weeks, he's been a force for this team, both in the run game and in the receiving game. Then on the defensive side of the ball, a couple of these rookies out of Ohio State, Jonathan Cooper on the edge has been a true bright spot for this defense, a dominating performance uh, against the Cowboys. But uh, man, this this guy's interesting. He's not a bad athlete. He's just kind of a hybrid linebacker, doesn't necessarily have the traits you look for to say he has elite upside as a rusher, but he packages all of the other stuff. He's uh, aggressive and physical against the run. He has some quickness to drop into coverage. And man, you look at some of these edge pieces in Denver, Malik Reed, Shaq Barrett, uh, these uh, the, the Broncos have done a great job with specifically undrafted or low-level investment edge players that play this hybrid role at a super high level, and Jonathan Cooper is next man up. It is eerily familiar to Shaq Barrett here, so keep an eye on this man. I don't know if he's ever going to be the pass rusher Shaq Barrett is or was, but we would have said the same thing about Shaq Barrett years ago that he's just not traitsy enough. Cooper's got that similar kind of it factor about him. So keep an eye on JC on the edge for Denver. And then Baron Browning has been uh, flushed into the rotation at linebacker and stepping up big time, uh, flying around the, the field, making tackles. This is another uber athlete out of Ohio State that was never able to find a position for the Buckeyes. But Denver has coached him up as an off-ball linebacker and are looking to make the most of his athleticism with Vic Fangio there. So there's your Denver Broncos. Next up, the Cleveland Browns, Wyatt Teller, the mad mauler himself. I don't know if that's what they call him, but they should. This dude just moves people in the run game. Simply put, gets a massive contract extension this week. Well, well deserved. Wide receiver, Dor I knew I should have written this down, man. Donovan Peoples-Jones, there it is. Uh, plus one, stepping in the shoes of Odell Beckham Jr. from one triple name to the next. DPJ, a little bit more better chemistry with Baker Mayfield, able to stack a little bit on the outside. Big-bodied guy, interesting upside as a former five-star recruit, I believe, that was just underutilized at Michigan. Uh, not just your typical late round receiver that you might say doesn't have wide receiver one upside. I don't think that's necessarily the case with DPJ. So high riser there. Really excited to see him get that full opportunity with Odell out. Strange enough, as that is to say. The two tight ends here doing a great job all across the board. David Njoku has worked on that blocking. Uh, he's a value for the for the Browns, man. For him to be their second, maybe third tight end with his athleticism, his ability to make plays in the receiving game, and the fact that he is no longer a liability as a run blocker, uh, I would think someone's got their eye on David Njoku as a upcoming free agent as far as I can remember. It feels like he's been here <laughs> in Cleveland forever, uh, but a former first-round pick kind of reaching that upside We'll see if, if Cleveland cashes out for him or if he hits the market. Because you got Harrison Bryant here, who's been a stable third receiver, just kind of a uh, tight end receiver. Uh, but when they go his way, he, he's got steady hands. He makes plays. I think he is a player that has likely a limited upside. He is a little bit smaller, but he's not like overly fast. So for that reason, he's not a great blocker and he's not this elite mismatch problem, but he's just steady. Then on the defensive side of the ball, Sheldon Day has been a bit of a spark plug as a pass rusher. He's got that six foot one, 285 pound kind of um, bowling ball mentality as a uh, interior issue for offensive lines in pass protection. Jordan Il Elliott. I'm still not a huge fan of Elliott's game, to be completely honest, and I wasn't uh, of him coming out either. But that said, he has gotten a boatload of playing time for the Browns and he hasn't been a liability. So he's going to go up. He's been fine. Again, I'm not crazy on Jordan Elliott, but he's been solid for what it's worth. We did Miles Garrett as our star of the week. Anthony Walker, a very nice pickup for the Browns. You know, he wasn't getting a ton of playing time early on because guys like Malcolm Smith and uh, Awusu Koromoa were really balling out. But opportunities have arose and Anthony Walker has stepped in. He's got that full size middle linebacker frame using it to his best advantage. And he, they have really not missed a beat from the linebackers. Thanks to Anthony Walker going up for the second week in a row. And then in the secondary, both Denzel Ward and Greg Newsome, both guys showing why we were so excited about this Brown secondary coming into the season. 
I said Denzel Ward has a chance this season to take that cornerback one crown. It does really vary heavily, that cornerback position. And you know what it takes to get the public eye to consider you the best corner in the football, uh, best cornerback in football? breaking on a Joe Burrow out route to Jamar Chase and having a game-changing 99-yard interception return on top of another multitude of pass breakups. I think he had three or four other ones in this game was locked down on Jamar Chase, who's been one of the best receivers in football this season. So a all-pro CB1 performance from Denzel Ward, who's been heating up lately. I'm a big fan of his game and his athleticism at that position. Former number four overall pick, playing some of his best football. And then Greg Newsom, their first round corner as well, has absolutely settled in. You know, early on in the season, this was just a young secondary as a whole. Greg Newsom was a part of that. But gosh, he has, like I said, just settled in. The game seems to be slowing down for him. He's in better position every week. The athleticism, the ability for him to flip his hips and break on balls quickly. These two corners are so sweet. There's no other way around it. Hey everyone, I just want to take a second to interrupt the video and remind you that if you enjoy the Madden aspect of everything that I do, to check out my second YouTube channel that is TFG Plays. That link is in the description below. Check it out where I am doing my realistic Bengals rebuild. Also, you can follow week by week condensed games of my online 32 man league as we are looking to restore the Niners to glory with Trey Lance. So if you enjoy the Madden side of things, all of my Madden content has moved to TFG plays and I encourage you to go follow over there and I'll see you there. Back to the video. All right, Tampa Bay, just week eight here. They were on by last week, but going back to that Saints game, Rakeem Nunez Rochez continues to be a good rotational veteran player up front for that ultra deep defensive front. Jamel Dean also uh, in the category to me of a cornerback one has always had the physical upside six foot 200 pounds real elite speed at the position but he has had a bit of an up and down career well not this season he has been locked down when he's been healthy as if the Bucks needed any more help. And Jordan Whitehead continuing to develop as well. These guys are just so comfortable in this defense. They play aggressive and build off each other so well. All of these skill sets complement each other so well. And Whitehead and Dean, both with versatility in their own right to contribute to that versatility. Then we got the Arizona Cardinals, just week nine here. We did that week eight Thursday night football game in our last episode of Studs and Duds. But that said, Huge team win from the Cardinals. Lots of players out due to injuries in this game. So a lot of guys stepping up and getting rewarded for that. Colt McCoy leading this team uh, in when they needed him. You know, backup quarterback comes in, gets you a big win in a game that you weren't supposed to win. That's a big deal. You know, Colt took care of business. He had that field general mentality. We know he's got his physical limitations, but it is so nice if you're the Cardinals to know you have a quarterback that can keep you in a game when you need him. Then these receivers, Christian Kirk really stepping up with your number one receiver out in DeAndre Hopkins, doing a little bit of everything for them. And then Antoine Wesley gets the start in this game as well with AJ Brown and DeAndre Hopkins out. Wesley with that six foot five frame, did his job when called upon a few catches in this game. And then on the offensive line, Sean Harlow also has to step up at left guard and plays decently. Uh, so just a lot of guys stepping up with injuries. James Conner, another one. You know, Chase Edmonds goes down in this game. Conner gets, I think, the most carries he's had on the season. And he's just really sound, man. He breaks tackles. He fights for tough yardage. He uh, takes care of the football. He's everything you want in a power back. And he's kind of back to the way he was perceived a little bit uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Then on the defense, Marcus Golden by far having the best year of his career. And with J.J. Watt out, it is such a relief for the Cardinals to know that Marcus Golden is breaking out here. Really on theme with a lot of veterans for the Cardinals that have ha <clears throat> somehow had late career reemergences here. Not that Golden was, was bad or anything, but man, he's been like a high-end number two all-around edge rusher this year. Defending the run better than he ever has and... Uh, both pressures and sacks way up for him. So Marcus Golden, uh, just a key contributor to that Cardinals defense. And then up front, Jordan Phillips, 
Remember, they gave him a massive contract last season. He's been a complete non-factor for the Cardinals, but uh, in this game against the Niners, he, he comes in, gets a bunch of snaps, rushes the passer, looks pretty good against the run. I mean, this dude is massive. He gets off the ball well and has power to him. He's just never had an element of really discipline or consistency to his game, and he played with that against the Niners. So keep an eye on Jordan Phillips. This is, like I said, been a theme for the Cardinals is these guys just reaching their potential in Arizona. And that's how you get a Super Bowl contender out of a team like the Cardinals is guys like Golden and Phillips getting that uh, big season out. Zach Allen, another one, a guy that has not had a lot of success for Arizona after being a well-perceived steal of a draft pick by myself and many included He's dealt with some injuries this season, but when he's been out there, he's playing his best ball. And one thing I like about the Cardinals is they're not just using him as that interior piece. He will do that. But what I liked about him at Boston College was his get off and technique as a pass rusher on the edge. And they're leaning into that a little bit more. And with JJ Watt gone, they'll obviously miss a beat, but it's good to get a guy like Zach Allen and get a Michael Dogby to at least give you you know, a portion of that role because these guys both have that hybrid defensive end in them, just like J.J. Watt, just obviously not at the same level. But like I said, it you never want to lose a J.J. Watt, but to have guys that can step up and play well, at least at a starting caliber level, that helps a ton. And then in the secondary, stepping up as well, Byron Murphy having his best season, really from start to finish, he's just been solid. And Marco Wilson, you know, he has been what a fifth round rookie should look like, which is a guy that's going to get attacked a lot when he's on the field as much as he has. He's going to get beat a lot, but he has not been terrible. And for a rookie corner, that is a good thing, in my opinion, especially a guy with the physical upside of a Marco Wilson. You know, he hasn't been a problem for the Cardinals necessarily. So he's gonna go up one and get some love. Okay, we've got the Chargers next up. Justin Herbert had a phenomenal game. Phenomenal against the Philadelphia Eagles. Of course, the big time throws down the field, but uh, getting rid of the ball, playing well in structure, the accuracy, just continuing to climb. I mean, the sky is the limit for Justin Herbert. And with Patrick Mahomes faltering, Rodgers not being quite what he was last year, that QB1 crown is in sight for Justin Herbert. He's not there yet. He doesn't have the track record of it um, or just the track record to warrant that conversation, but I'm just gonna say it's in sight. Climbing up, Justin Herbert having an unbelievable season in year two, just an unbelievable career based on what myself and so many people said about him coming out of Oregon, uh, just a completely different quarterback. Then the offensive line, really love across the board. This group was the number one I don't even know if it was a question coming into the year, but it was obviously the focal point. And these four players were additions for the Chargers and huge additions at that. I mean, you watch that Eagles game. Yes, Herbert was incredible, but the time he had to throw and the lanes these guys were clearing in the run game were so noticeable. And that's against a talented Eagles front. And this goes back to the Patriots game as well. But Rashawn Slater, it's it's comparable to what Tristan Wirfs did last year, coming in as like the 13th overall pick, whatever it was, 12th maybe, and just being a top 10 tackle immediately. That's, you, you, just, you cannot, it, there, there's no words to describe how impactful Rashawn Slater has been this year. And if he wasn't an offensive lineman, he'd be in the rookie of the year conversation. Matt Filer having his best season Coming in here for the Chargers, he is deleting people in the run game. This dude is an absolute badass. I love Matt Filer. I don't know why he was so cheap, but the Chargers stole him. And they stole Corey Lindsley, who is back to being the best center in football. These three moves highlight the Chargers offseason, and they have all been grand slam finales. Just tip of the cap to the Chargers front office. And even getting a Michael Schofield to step in at right guard after Odea Bushi, which was another good signing. Uh, Bushi uh, tears his ACL, I think, and Michael Schofield has stepped in and been a solid you know, player at right guard. The only thing they're missing is right tackle, is Storm Norton, who's still an issue. But 
man, well, way to overhaul your offensive line overnight. Uh, then you have um, uh, Steven Anderson, Donald Parham, these rotational tight ends. Because, you know, Cook is still playing well, but they find creative ways to get these guys involved. Steven Anderson is kind of that H-back type. He's the guy that defenses lose on screens and leak plays, and he has athleticism, and he's a good blocker. He's like part fullback, part tight end. And then Donald Parham, I tweeted this uh, a clip of, of him out that I'll, I'll try to show right now, but the future between Parham and Justin Herbert is highly intriguing, and it's eerily familiar to uh, the combination of Philip Rivers and um, Antonio Gates. They got Gates in a weird way, a former basketball player. Donald Parham uh, makes his way up through, what is it, Fordham, I think? Maybe something, some other tiny school. Goes to the XFL, was the best player in that league, not named P.J. Walker and then uh, goes off every time he gets his number called. He's athletic, he blocks his butt off. He's gotten stronger since he got into the league and his ball skills are electric. This dude has, dare I say, oh, I don't wanna say Darren Waller upside because I don't think he's as fast. I'm just gonna say top five tight end in the NFL potential paired with Justin Herbert's ball placement ability. <sighs> Man, 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 man. Exciting stuff. Then on the defensive side of the ball, Kaiser White stepping up with uh, opportunities open in that linebacker spot with uh, Kenneth uh, Murray, I think, done for the season. But Kaiser White, former college safety, flying around, making some plays really in every regard at the linebacker spot. And then Nasir Adderley was on my breakout list, and he continues to have a solid season. Nothing amazing here, but jumping a couple of... Uh, you know, routes over the middle from that free safety spot. He also allows Derwin James to do all of the things he does underneath because they don't need Derwin to play single high free safety. Nasir Adderley is competent at that. So good to see Nasir Adderley finally kind of reach his potential here in what, year three? Okay, now the Kansas City Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes is going to come down again. I do believe in him to turn this thing around, but that's four straight weeks of, of, non-elite quarterback play and dare I say average quarterback play. He's missing throws down the field. He's not taking what's there. He's continuing to create turnover worthy plays. This really shouldn't need to be explained, but because it is Patrick Mahomes, um, there are going to be people that disagree with this, but the reality is Patrick Mahomes has not been even a very good quarterback this year and he needs to really self-correct a lot of this stuff. I think he's very capable of it and I'm excited to see him do it because I miss that Patrick Mahomes, but unfortunately, we have not gotten that Patrick Mahomes this season. But it isn't all bad for the Chiefs offense, especially when you look at the run game that does work when they want to use it. They just hate the run game because you have Patrick Mahomes and Hill and Kelsey and they don't want to go to it, but maybe they should a little more. Derek Gore was someone I had to create actually in my Madden roster uh, at a 67 overall. Now, he looks solid, you know, looks like a nice find, kind of that guy that can come in and change the pace in the other way, add some of that patience and physicality to the run game. I'm not going to say I'm overly impressed by Derek Gore. I don't think he's particularly explosive. I think he is. his production has been largely a um, result of the best run blocking in the league, which they have, believe it or not. And that's reflected here with Orlando Brown, Creed Humphrey, Trey Smith, Lucas Niang, just straight up mauling dudes, moving people up front. Creed Humphrey has been one of the best centers in the entire NFL. That's the saving grace for the Chiefs right now is the offensive line is playing really good and that gives them something to build off. I think getting Clyde Edwards Hilaire back will actually open this offense up a decent amount because it's going to force teams to respect the run a lot. With all due respect to Derek Gore, who's playing well, he just doesn't offer the same ability to create explosives that Clyde Edwards Hilaire does. And then on the defensive side of the ball, they've got some pieces settling in and Daniel Sorensen's gonna come down to a 65. He's been the dud of the season. He's the worst player in the NFL in that he hurts his team more than any player in the NFL currently. So he's coming down, but Willie Gay getting more and more and more playing time showing that he needs to be a full-time starter for this, this team if he isn't already, jumps the Daniel Jones um, little, you know, little uh, spot route for a touchdown and, or it might have been a slant, but either way, 
Uh, he's playing really well. And then in the secondary, they're actually settling in. Rashad Fenton is emerging as a legitimate starting caliber CB2. He's still kind of a part of a rotation here, but he's been awesome. And then Legereus Sneed, an really impressive performance against Devontae Adams uh, and, and the Packers. You know, yes, it was Jordan Love in there and all this stuff, but if you, for those of you that watched my film room, Legereus Sneed was outstanding in this game, showing off the speed, the press ability, the quickness, the ability to get his head around the interception he had on Devontae Adams. Yes, a little bit of an overthrow by Jordan Love, but not by much. Uh, that was a really tough interception that he came down with. So Legereus Sneed, after we lowered him last week, has turned around and gone right back to looking like a number one corner. He has had some ups and downs this year but I think he's gonna to continue to ascend. So it's not all bad for the Kansas City Chiefs. They do win um, a couple weeks in a row here. It's been not in the same way that we're used to for the Chiefs, uh, but some love to go around. Okay, the Colts, the run game, really working here. Jonathan Taylor speaks for itself. He's been just a monster. When I said, uh, what I said about him coming out was he's blue collar Leonard Fournette, and I think that has um, surfaced to the nth degree. That's like exactly what he is. Uh, Naheem Hines has been just a sweet compliment. Of course, what he does in the receiving game, he's one of the best receiving backs in the NFL, but he's actually been a nice counterpunch as a runner. He breaks tackles. He's got good vision and juice. So Naheem Hines has been sweet. They gave him a contract extension. These guys are going to be a problem uh, for a long time in Indianapolis. Eric Fisher clearly was just not healthy to start the year. I think that's fair to say because he <laughs> he came out and got demolished, kind of rushed back from that Achilles injury, but he, he's been playing lights out football. Dare I say the best football he's ever played, and that's been just a, such a invaluable boost to that offensive line. And the amount of time Carson Wentz has had to push the ball downfield to a Michael Pittman here, it all builds off each other, right? But Pittman, I, I still will say, I don't think he's ever going to be Devontae Adams or Justin Jefferson or Stephon Diggs. I just don't see the separation when I watch Michael Pittman, but you know what he can be is prime Alshon Jeffrey. He could even be Mike Evans, um, maybe Michael Thomas. Uh, he's a little different. He plays a little more on the outside than Michael Thomas, but that's, that's the way I view Michael Pittman is just one of the most reliable pair of hands in the NFL. And when you have a quarterback that, that does want to put it up for a Michael Pittman that has played really good football with an Elshon Jeffrey years and years ago, it's it's very familiar where Carson Wentz gets in trouble and he says, where's my dude, Michael Pittman, help me out. And he is such a great compliment for that. Uh, so I'm not trying to dunk on Michael Pittman. I, I just, I did see a tweet going around from a big check mark on Twitter that said, Michael Pittman is officially a wide receiver number one. I just have a different understanding of what a, a wide receiver number one is because Personally, I really want a guy that can separate on all three levels of the field to be my number one receiver. So I'm just prepping Colts fans that I'm pr it's going to be a while before I call Michael Pittman a, a true number one receiver. Hell, I don't even call Mike Evans a true number one wide receiver by my personal definition of that word. So just throwing that out there. But regardless, I've been super impressed by Michael Pittman. And then on the defensive side of the ball, they seem to have found something in Taylor Stallworth, who is stepping up in a rotation, doing a little bit of everything. And then Quiddy Pay coming alive as a pass rusher. He has actually been a borderline elite run defender this season. Uh, but for whatever reason, clicking into place late in this season, uh, what did he have? Nine pressures against the Jets? Really impressive outing. Uh, showing off that quickness and ability to get after the quarterback. This was a position the Colts needed to hit on, and for all indications, they seem to have hit on Quiddy Pay. Then the Cowboys. Believe it or not, Terrence Steele is going to go up because he was really good at right tackle against the Vikings. So that's the fourth week in a row for the under-the-radar tackle. But that said... They slide him to left tackle, and this has been a theme this year, is some guys revealing that they just, they can't just, you know, this isn't Madden. It's a nice little tangent here, because uh, yes, these are Madden ratings, but this isn't Madden. This is real life we're talking about here. You can't just flip that right tackle to left tackle for everybody and assume that the 
muscle memory and the technique is just going to perfectly transition to the other side. And in Terrence Steele's case, that does seem to be an issue. He was just terrible against Jonathan Cooper and was obliterated at left tackle. So you do got to note that it's safe to assume if he were to play right tackle again, he would go back to being the quality starter that he's been this year, like he was against Minnesota. Um, but they liked him so much, they tried him at left tackle and he was terrible. So I will note that, but week eight, he was good at right tackle. So just keep him at right and this 67 should hold up. Cooper Rush going to get some love for his big win. He wasn't really good in that game, made a couple throws late, uh, but he's a backup, but was just rated way too low, 50 to a 58. Uh, Carlos Watkins and, and Justin Hamilton, a part of a rotation there, a couple veterans that have been nice depth for the Cowboys, as has Dorrance Armstrong, who has done a really good job. Hats off to him for beefing up. This dude was like 230 pounds coming out of Kansas. He was a true speed rusher without a lot of speed. Um, but recognizing that he's going to have to beef up if he wants to stick in the NFL and play a little bit of run defense and, and be a part of a rotation uh, as a guy that doesn't have elite traits. And he's done that. He's, he's become a quality player for them. Randy Gregory <laughs> has been a, a fun story this year. Uh, just blowing up defensive lines, sack master, pressure master, showing some power that hasn't always been a part of his game. He's always been viewed as a speed rusher, but now that he has that threat of the long arm bull rush, ooh, man, he's been one of the better edge, edge players in the league this year. Just like Micah Parsons <laughs> when, he, when he does play edge. Such a unique player to evaluate. He's a positionless pursuit master is really what Micah Parsons is. Uh, still kind of doesn't understand the game, just kind of see ball, hit ball. But with a defensive coordinator that understands how to use a player like this, I think that Dan Quinn is really calling back to his days of Bruce Irvin, who was kind of an old version of Micah Parsons, first round pick. No one really understood how they were going to use him in Seattle. Um, but Dan Quinn there really got the best out of uh, Bruce Irvin as that sometimes he's a linebacker, sometimes he's uh, lining up at edge, just find the ball, fly there and bring the guys to the, to the ground. And Micah Parsons' ability to get to the ball carrier and then tackle him sure-handedly once he gets there is already at the top of the league, if not the absolute top. So plus one for Micah Parsons, the first round pick, probably defensive rookie of the year right now. I don't know who else is really um, pushing him for that at the same level. And then Trayvon Diggs, we did for our dud of the week. All right, we're through the C's, onto the D's, the Dolphins, uh, Liam Eichenberg gonna go down again. Um, and again, this is not gonna include Thursday night football, just so you know. Um, but Liam Eichenberg, uh, actually at left tackle, not right tackle, that's a typo, but he is going to go down one. That is just not working for him at left tackle. Javon Holland, I can tell you right now, he's going to go up again, if not twice, uh, for his Thursday Night Football performance, but he has totally come on. And what you'll notice about Javon Holland, and this is why I raised him above Trayvon Merrick uh, as my number one safety in this class, is yes, he has range in uh, a single high type of free safety assignment. Uh, but what I liked about Holland over a guy like Merrick was A, his ability to go man to man and play from the slot. But he stunned me with his ability to take on blocks at the line of scrimmage to get off those blocks and his long arms and the tackling ability, his blitzing ability showing up in that way. And the Dolphins are really leaning into that. They are just kind of lining him up all over the place, letting him pin his ears back uh, around the line of scrimmage, and he's playing well uh, in coverage. So Javon Holland is a stud of a rookie, and maybe he makes a case for defensive rookie of the year if he continues to ball out. I don't know. Uh, he had a bit of a slower start, but he, he's been out there and, and playing really well all season. Xavier Howard's going to come down 88 to an 87. I know he had the awesome scoop and score against uh, the, the Ravens, and maybe he gets this overall point back once I review how he played. But leading into this game um, uh, against the Ravens last night, he has not been the same cover player. He's actually been a below average cover player this season, just kind of a player that can be had out there. 
but he just also happens to have all-time elite ball skills on top of that. So when he is in good position, he makes the most of it, which you love. But you also don't love having a corner that can be beat fairly easily, which has been Xavier Howard this year. So minus one for Howard. Okay, the Eagles, lots of movement here. They're playing some interesting football. They're getting some contributions from some really un under the radar, unknown players here. So Jalen Hurts playing solid football. He's still just so erratic as a passer. The accuracy really pretty poor against the Chargers, but they're leaning into what he does as a runner. He doesn't make a ton of terrible mistakes, which you like, like he clearly knows what he's doing. It's just so inconsistent, but it's been solid for Jalen Hurts. He leads a functional offense for the Eagles, I would just say. A big part of that is Devonta Smith, who has just been so good, man. He is unbelievable. He's so refined as a route runner. His ability to attack the football in traffic. He is a true number one wide receiver, and what a great draft pick he was. Um, and then you have on the offensive line, a couple pieces, Jordan Mailata. This was good foresight by this front office. It really was. He's a hard worker. He's a freak athlete. His technique seems to be get better week after week. And I'm a big fan of Jordan Mailata, the big bruiser up front, who's developing his pass protection to levels that you just don't expect from a guy that was a seventh round pick, a foreigner to the game, and quite literally from Australia. Uh, to just put the amount of work in that it takes to become a polished pass protector, it's very admirable. Uh, so plus one for Jordan Mailata. Nate Herbig, Herbig, he started some games last year, was a solid pass protector, gets the start this week uh, due to an injury at right guard. So that was week eight against the Lions. And then Jack Stoll, my dude, one of my uh, super sleepers in this draft class, uh, I kind of knew he was going to go undrafted, but I did have a fifth round grade on Jack Stoll, a guy that got underutilized in Nebraska's anemic offense, but was a lights out blocker. Uh, he is sweet, man. He's athletic. He's tough. I'm a big fan of Jack Stoll. I think they like what they see in him. They wanted to get him more playing time when they traded away Zach Ertz, and he is stepping up as their number two tight end. So looking like a good draft steal for the Eagles and a good draft call by me here on the channel. And then we got Dallas Goddard, also a benefit of trading away Zach Ertz, is you actually had a better tight end in Dallas Goddard, who can now become more of a focal point of the passing game and be leaned on full time for his elite ability as a blocker. Dallas Goddard is awesome. He is not Gronk, but Gronk, if you know what I mean. Like he is that do it all, full size, badass tight end that every team would drool to have. So Dallas Goddard, it's a total stud. Jordan Howard, late career emergence. It is what it is. He's fine. He's Jordan Howard. I'm going to move on. Hassan Ridgeway on the defensive line, uh, continuing to climb along with Milton Williams, who is interesting. A third round pick, ultra athlete, was quite possibly the worst player in the NFL for the first six, seven weeks. I uh, had like a hundred and something pass rush reps without a single pressure and was getting obliterated against the run. Uh, but much, much, much better the last couple of weeks, holding his ground much more against the run and starting to get after the quarterback much more. I love Milton Williams, uh, but was a player that maybe needed a little bit of time to get used to some things. So uh, that seems to be happening for Milton Williams. And then uh, Edge Teron Jackson has been getting after the quarterback a little bit as a part of a rotation. And then TJ Edwards out of Wisconsin. Uh, what, year three undrafted linebacker? He was actually a breakout player for me last season. Didn't quite hit, but maybe a post-hype breakout here for TJ Edwards, who's been just very solid. He's a big, fast, strong linebacker, loves to tackle and thump. Not the smartest cover player per se, but he's not a complete liability in that regard. Okay, we got the Atlanta Falcons definitely heating up. The Falcons, uh, looking back at this, were, were one of the more fascinating studs and duds teams here because they're really figuring themselves out in this new regime and that seven seed in the NFC is wide open. Uh, so I'm excited to see what they look like against Dallas this week. But Corderell Patterson, they really lean into his versatility so, so well. And the last couple of weeks, it's been much more as a receiver. Uh, but the fact that teams have to respect him as a running back is fascinating. I mean, he's he's made some really beautiful plays, even stepping out uh, as an outside receiver, beating cornerbacks and safeties. 
Uh, he is just the ultimate mismatch problem. So he's been so fun to watch. He's He's been one of the better offensive players in the NFL this season. Olamide Zacchaeus, versatile, undersized, mini receiver. You guys know I love my mini receivers. And the Falcons have a good one in Olamide Zacchaeus, who can separate and uh, catch the ball when it's thrown his way, which is uh, a good combination of traits, believe it or not, for a receiver, even if you're five foot eight. Tajay Sharp. Um, let's see, would he have, now that I think about it, would he have worked with Arthur Smith in Tennessee like four years ago when Tajay Sharp was considered a solid starting caliber receiver? That seems to add up for me. Uh, they reunite here and Tajay Sharp showing a similar skill set, just being a nice depth piece and a possession receiver for Matt Ryan. And then on the offensive line, these young guys are really settling in. They struggled early on, especially when you look at Jalen Mayfield, who was a complete liability. He's been much less of a liability lately, so he's trending back up. I liked him as a guard convert out of Michigan. Really didn't like him at tackle, but uh, learning that new position, also switching to the left side of the line, I think that was a big ask for a young Jalen Mayfield, but it's been good to see him settle in. Caleb McGarry, more of a veteran. He's playing well at right tackle. And then Matt Hennessy was on my breakout list this season. And the last two, three, four games, he has been awesome. He's been a borderline top 10 center in the NFL through the month of October. So really fun to see Matt Hennessy, who I think the Falcons had a great plan. He was a raw athlete who needed a year to sit and develop. And what a better situation than to do that behind Alex Mack. And then when they assign the starting role to him, they also give him the perfect scheme fit where he can lean into his ability as a move zone outside stretch run blocker. So Matt Hennessy uh, on my breakout list this year, having a very good season, hoping he can continue to climb and show his upside at the position. I think that's a, a great story and just um, kind of a model for how to develop a young player from uh, sit and develop to drafting a raw prospect to giving the correct scheme fit to a player. It's been, I, I just love when a team does smart stuff like this. Uh, so Matt Hennessy, good stuff. Then on the defense, James Vodder has been a pleasant surprise as well. They pick him up off the street. He actually had a good year for the, uh, the Bears. So keep in mind, you know, Vodder's on the Bears last year, a part of that Fangio tree defensively, just like we talked about with Malik Reed and um, with Jonathan Cooper as that hybrid edge, you know, 3-4 outside linebacker type of player. And that is James Vodder's. He's a smart, tough dude. He's a little bit different because he's more powerful. He's kind of shorter and stocky, uh, but he has a little bit of that pocket pushing ability as well in this more Baltimore Ravens oriented Falcons defense where they do like to blitz and um, get pocket pushers. So he fits the mold very well. A nice scouting pickup by the Falcons. Talk about nice scouting. AJ Terrell was a second round pick. This guy is trending towards being a true alpha corner. He has speed. He has real 4-4 speed. He's lengthy. He's tough he gets in people's face he is so sweet man he's been maybe the best cornerback in the NFL this year he has I think nine pass breakups and is only allowed like 13 catches he's been stable every week he hasn't had a bad game he's a freak athlete he should have been a first round pick I compared him to Xavier Rhodes coming out I think he's better than Xavier Rhodes ever was big fan of AJ Terrell skyrocketing up and then Jalen Hawkins um I, he was completely off my radar in the draft. They took him in the fourth round. They clearly saw something. This dude is just smart and plays fast. Uh, he's forced his way into this rotation of safeties where they needed someone to step up and, and get that. They, they aren't getting it from their second round pick out of UCF, but they are out of Jalen Hawkins. So uh, boosts in the secondary, much needed for the Falcons and these guys stepping up. All right, the Washington football team, nothing too exciting, and they were on by week nine, uh, but DeAndre Carter stepping up, you know, smaller, quick, versatile, uh, do-it-all receiver, I suppose. J.D. McKissick contributing, uh, continuing to be a high-level contributor in the receiving game. Uh, interesting here, though, Sadiq Charles gets the start at right tackle. 
I got to look up who the, the offensive line coach is for Washington because they are plug and play there, man. They get all these guys to play high level offensive line. It's just a shame they don't have um, a better quarterback to open up this offense. But uh, Sadiq Charles was a mid round pick for them, a freak athlete out of LSU, a player a lot of people, myself included, said should not have come out. But now a year later, didn't play much as a, as a rookie. I think he was actually hurt. Uh, seems to have put on some weight and taking this NFL thing quite seriously because he came out and played outstanding football week eight at right tackle. Probably going to go back to the bench as soon as those guys are healthy, but interesting because this dude is quick as hell, uh, but was just young and frankly bad coming out of LSU. But the upside is certainly there for Sadiq Charles and also intriguing knowing what the football team has done with these young uh, not just young, just offensive line in general. Everybody plays their best ball here, seemingly. Uh, Chase Rolier also playing his best ball. Veteran center, dude's a stud, one of the better ones in the league. Uh, so the quarterback play really holding back this offense and maybe the lack of a number two receiver as well. Um, maybe Curtis Samuel can give them that as he hopes to get healthy here. All right, the San Francisco 49ers. So you got to think back, you know, they had a super disappointing game against the Cardinals, obviously, but they did move the ball. Also, this offense opened up against the Bears defense, so the, they are gonna get some boost here. It's not all pessimism for the Niners, even though there is a lot of that pessimism. And Jimmy Garoppolo actually hasn't been that bad, uh, especially in that Bears game. He was borderline really good. Um, you know, accuracy is always a thing with Jimmy Garoppolo, but he's decisive, he moves well in the pocket, that rapid release is so sweet when you have guys like Ayuk and Debo and Kittle who are so good after the catch. It's not all just terrible for Jimmy Garoppolo like I think Twitter and some of the people uh, out there make it seem because everyone wants to see Trey Lance and I understand that. But Jimmy is actually playing pretty good ball getting healthy these last couple weeks. Then Elijah Mitchell, great fine fifth round pick. I think I said in my deep dive that I wouldn't be stunned if Elijah Mitchell turned out to be a better player than Trey Sermon. I, I, I got to go back and double check that, but man, he's traitsy. He's got speed. He's got toughness, got vision. There's a reason he's the guy getting the reps now that he's healthy again for the Niners. Then the offensive line on the left side playing great. Right side, not so much. And they lost Mike McGlinchey this week, which sucks. The 49 IRs continue to be the 49 IRs. But Trent Williams, plus two, uh, noteworthy in Madden now, 99 across the board for all run blocking traits. This dude is, like I like to say, deleting people in the run game. His ability on the move in these zone runs is legendary, Hall of Fame, whatever word you want to say that embodies eliteness. That is Trent Williams, and he's still one of the better pass protectors in the game. So to me, Trent Williams is the best offensive tackle in the NFL. Sorry, David Bakhtiari, excited to get him back uh, pretty soon and maybe a better pass protector, but Trent Williams does something nobody in the NFL does. And that is honestly like block two people at the same time on almost every play. It's it's stupid. Uh, and he's got Lincoln Tomlinson next to him, former first round pick who has, he, he's very underrated for the Niners. And I think his contract is coming up We'll see what the Niners do here. I mean, he's he should be pretty damn expensive. I mean, he should be a 10 plus million dollar player. This is a guy that does have a former first round pedigree that just busted for Detroit, which tends to happen when the Detroit Lions draft you. But pretty much ever since he's been here for the Niners, he's had that development track that you would have liked to see from a former first round pick. Smart dude coming out of Stanford. Uh, can get on the move and block you. He's, he's got an anchor and pass protection. He is a very, very high level guard. Uh, then we've got these receivers, Debo Samuel, is going to go up one because the dude continues to make incredible plays and climb the wide receiver rankings discussions. But it is really worth noting that the guy also has nine drops this year. So I, I had to lower his catch ratings. Uh, but pretty much other than that, this guy's been electric. Run after the catch, verticality, ability to win contested balls. It, oh, man, Debo's been incredible. Brandon Ayuk also off or out of the doghouse, I guess. He's had, I think, over six targets the last couple of weeks uh, and doing a lot with those. He he looks back to kind of where he was last year, which is a really nice compliment to Debo. 
as that route runner and separator over the middle of the field with good right after the catch ability. Then Charlie Warner stepping up as that number two tight end for the Niners. This guy was a great run blocker for the Georgia Bulldogs, and he's been the same here for the Niners. Been impressed by his ability to develop and get on the field for the Niners. He's having a good season as tight end two, and he stepped up when Kittle was hurt. And then just one player on the defense, DJ Jones, I believe in a contract season, playing his best football as a run defender, doing some stuff as a pass rusher as well. So plus one for DJ Jones. Okay, the New York Giants. Uh, Billy Price is actually going to go up. I can't believe I'm saying that, but the last couple of weeks, he's been starting at center and doing okay at it. The bar is very low, but we'll keep an eye on that. Former first round pick, never want to write anybody off. Will Hernandez, on the other hand, has been struggling a lot lately and, and really the last couple of seasons. I mean, when he came into the league, was viewed as a steal in the second round and balled out early on, but as a pass protector, he's been below average for years, and he's not creating that same buzz as a run blocker either. So he's going to come down probably well overdue and, and could be due for coming down even more. I mean, he's just not a good player right now. You know who is kind of a good player, though? John Ross. <laughs> just kind of sneaks in there, runs 50 yards down the field, and makes a catch every couple of weeks. And I love what... Uh, it was one of the PFF podcasts. I can't remember the, the specific analyst that kind of made this point, but I love comparing him to Ted Ginn, who was bust, drafted way too high because of his speed, bounced around a little bit, and then eventually kind of learned how to play in the NFL for his skill set. I feel like John Ross is kind of headed that way. And yeah, I mean, he's made some pretty spectacular catches showing off that verticality. So nice little pickup for the Giants. Then you get Kyle Rudolph, st um, you know, locking in there as the tight end, just kind of being Kyle Rudolph, coming down with contested catches. He's blocking better the last few weeks. So Kyle Rudolph plus one veteran presence at tight end. And then on the defense, Quincy Roche, player a lot of people liked, a lot of people thought was going to make an impact as a rotational third for Pittsburgh. Turns out he's going to do it as a rotational third for the New York Giants. After they pick him up, he doesn't make the team. And, you know, Roche has uh, a nice polish on his skill set as a pass rusher. He's shown that a couple times for the Giants. But what we know about the Giants is in this 3-4 scheme, they love hybrid skill sets, often leaning on guys that are a little more in that 245, 250 pound range, which fits Quincy Roche very well. Drops into coverage. He's defending the run much, much better than he projected coming out of Miami. So a very nice pickup of Quincy Roche, who at at worst is looks like he's gonna have a nice career as a rotational third edge player. Reggie Ragland has really stepped in nicely at linebacker. He's filled the Blake Martinez role as that run defender up front, the guy that is a veteran and can communicate things. It's been a nice pickup. And then in the secondary, Xavier McKinney, an elite week nine performance against the Raiders, two interceptions. This dude's a ball hockey, was at Alabama. Not the fastest guy on the field, but he is instinctive. He's been playing all around good football, Xavier McKinney has and plus two for the year two safety out of Alabama. This guy doesn't even have 16 starts under his belt quite yet. He's got a very nice ceiling as a do-it-all kind of rangy cover safety. Uh, then we've got Julian Love, more of that versatile slot, strong safety, slot corner type, can play a little bit of free safety. He also has been playing nicely um, for the Giants. I think that Jabril Peppers is done for the season. So to get these guys to um, move around and make some plays next to Logan Ryan. Uh, that is an asset to have that level depth for that defense. All right, the Jacksonville Jaguars building a little bit up this week. The offensive line, Andrew Norwell playing some of his best football under Urban Meyer. And Ben Barch, St. John's very own Division Three Minnesota local school. Also a, a senior bowl kind of Love child, but he has been starting at right guard and looks really good. I mean, I, I don't see a reason to go back to AJ Can. I don't know if that was a benching situation or if AJ Can was injured, but Ben Barch truly making the most of those opportunities uh, and been really good in both run um, blocking and pass pro. Uh, then these tight ends, Chris Manhurts blocking his ass off so that Dan Arnold doesn't have to. 
Dan Arnold's not a blocker, but he is a mismatch problem at tight end. So th these guys build off each other pretty nicely. And then Jamal Agnew, he has been the versatile offensive weapon that Urban Meyer was looking for when he wanted to draft Kadarius Toney, when he did draft uh, Travis Etienne. Don't get me started on that. They found it in Jamal Agnew of converted slot corner, almost like you don't need to invest that much in the playmaker type to find one. But regardless, they've got it in Jamal Agnew making plays, uh, getting a ton of targets. I, I wish kind of it was LaVisca Chenault, not Jamal Agnew, but hey, Agnew's doing a good job with it, so let's not take too much from him. Uh, it's been a fun story. And then on defense, Josh Allen was super close to being my star of the week. I just elected to go with Miles Garrett instead, but the Josh Allen game where it was this Josh Allen that got the best of the quarterback, Josh Allen. But it's been a trend this season is Josh Allen being the face of this defense, being a superstar on that side of the ball, we know he has a ton of potential, and he's showing it in all phases of the game. Run defense, pass rush, where he has developed his skill set and is showing more and more power than he did at Kentucky. And then just to have that flexibility to drop into coverage and get a pick six on uh, Josh Allen, like this dude is incredibly versatile and talented, and he's been a super fun watch for Jags fans as has Dwayne Smoot. He is one of my favorite players in the NFL. I'm a little biased because I liked him coming out of Illinois, and I thought this was a good pick. This was kind of one of my earlier draft classes, but he had a lot of polish and power coming out of Illinois, just not a great athlete, but I'm just always a sucker for guys that clearly are hard workers, professionals at their craft, and make really good NFL careers when many, many players with similar athleticism just flame out. And that's Dwayne Smoot. I mean, he's beefed up. He continues to show that he has a good pass rushing skill set. He defends the run. He does everything this team could ask of him. And he's an asset. He is the opposite of Caleb on Chesson, who has all the talent in the world, but just doesn't put it all together. And it's, it's, I don't know. I just like to see those blue collar guys thrive over potentially a guy like Jason that just hasn't been able to kind of put on weight and develop his game. I, I just, not to crap on Jason, but Smoot is, that is kind of the reason I like a guy like Dwayne Smoot so much. And unfortunately, Caleb on Jason became the target there. Hope Jason puts on 20 pounds and starts having 20 sack seasons. I, I don't care, but I just love Dwayne Smoot and his story. He also delivered his own um, baby like two weeks ago because uh, they couldn't get to the ambulance in time. Just super fun story. Cool player. Uh, wanted to talk him up. And then Damian Wilson stepping in at linebacker. Just been a good good tackle guy. He's never a good cover player, but um, was a nice pickup. They haven't missed much of a beat. Moving on from Joe Schobert, getting cheaper at that position, bringing in Damian Wilson. Just kind of a even swap there. And then Tyson Campbell, He's been solid, similar to a lot of these young corners that we talk about where, yes, he will get beat, but for them to get full-time playing time and not be a liability and have some good plays mixed in there, that's as much as you can ask from any rookie corner. I like Tyson Campbell, uh, so he's a good scheme fit, kind of that bump and run man cover guy, and he's doing his job well. Shaq Griffin also has settled in in this system. Uh, he totally it was a an intriguing player because he played more of that cover three zone heavy defense in Seattle for so long, and it led to a lot of inconsistent play because he's never been a guy with great zone instincts. But just get him in guys' faces, bump and run coverage, like we said with Tyson Campbell, he is he's playing some of his best ball. So these these two young corners look good, um, and and that's. Nice, considering they traded away C.J. Henderson and, and let Sidney, Sidney Jones go. At least they were right in that they have two guys that can play, which seems to be the case. And then Rudy Ford's also intriguing. He's playing a little bit of everything. This is a guy that's kind of been a special teamer. I think they gave him, didn't they? Let me just take a second, because didn't they give Rudy Ford like a decent contract here to play special teams? Um yeah, they're paying him $4 million, which when they did that, I was like, that is so stupid. This is a guy that had no track record of playing any anything close to starting caliber safety play. Um, but just like they did with Jamal Agnew, these guys that looked like special team signings, overpaid special team signings, they've actually been really integrated into their team and have played well. And Rudy Ford has done that in that hybrid safety slot corner, just DB position. 
and and they seem to have hit there. So the Jags are, I guess, doing a little bit of proving people wrong, myself included, in little areas here. I think there's a lot of fair criticism with the Urban Meyer regime, probably overshadowing the good stuff. But some of their weird college thinking is leading to some good here. So we'll give credit where credit's due, as I always do on this channel. Okay, the New York Jets, Mike White going up. Uh, it, it was one good start, got injured um, against the Colts, but he was a 48 overall on my Madden roster, so he's going to go up to 59. It was a good game, though. He did really get through his progressions quickly, something Zach Wilson really has struggled with. I think you saw a combination of the actual structure of the plays for the Jets being there as far as separation and the pass protection has been a little bit better there. So that helped, but Mike White was getting rid of the ball quicker and, and doing real NFL quarterbacking stuff as a veteran that's been in this league for a few years, made the most of his opportunities. We're going to get to see him again this week. Been a fun story and he played well. Obviously, plus 11, 48 to a 59. Am I expecting anything other than him to be a backup for the rest of his career? No, but we'll continue to collect more information on him. Elijah Moore, the last couple of weeks, getting a ton of targets from these backups, getting more and more opportunities and, and making the most of it. His route running is truly impressive. His ability to separate is quite special for a young rookie. So hopefully they can continue to understand how to properly use Elijah Moore and we can see him ascend. Then Denzel Mims, on the other hand, um, talk about bad route running. I mean, this guy just basically runs in straight lines. He's been dropping balls. The coaching staff hates him. I, I was not a Denzel Mims guy. I thought he was really overhyped. I ended up with a second to a third round grade on him. People thought this was a steal. And I don't know. It's just a reminder. You got to be careful with one year breakout players. Um, and, and I think Denzel Mims, especially guys that break out in their senior year when they exist in explosive passing offenses and don't have like elite players in front of them throughout their career. Denzel Mims comes to mind when, when you look at that being a red flag. I, I don't know. I, I'm just not a big Denzel Mims guy. I never really was. Uh, so he's coming down really, really looking like he's, he's a bust at this point, but we'll see. Uh, then we got running back Ty Johnson, explosive player, making some impact in the receiving game along with Michael Carter, who I almost boosted this week. We'll see. I want to see one more week from him. And then Tyler Croft also uh, calling, uh, meeting the call as a decent, big body, big target, tight end uh, that they're utilizing pretty well here. So some low level players for the Jets, getting some boosts. Then we got to talk about the Lions. So Chris, uh, sorry. Uh, Godwin Igwebuike, I think I said Chris because it's Godwin, uh, a converted safety out of Northwestern. I remember Godwin Igwebuike being on my radar as a sleeper coming out because this dude had like ungodly agility testing, um, but just not an overly fast guy. Uh, he has some speed though, but you know, he's not like a super rangy safety or anything like that. And he was like 5'11", 210 pounds. So he's like half linebacker, half safety. But Detroit picks him up and they're like, hey, let's see if we can channel your uber quickness into some running back play. And turns out he gets a couple opportunities this week and looks pretty good out there. So keep an eye on Godwin Iguibuike making a mid-career conversion to a different position. You don't see this very often, but it's fun when you see it. So we'll see if he continues to get more opportunities as the season goes on. Uh, on the offensive line, Jonah Jackson, been really terrible in pass protection, honestly, but he is mauling up front in the run block game. So going to get some respect there. And then Derek Barnes, they're giving him opportunities. This is a part of Jamie Collins uh, and his departures. You get a look at Derek Barnes to see if you have something there. And he's kind of doing what he projected to do as a converted edge rusher with a ton of speed and ability to bring guys down in space. It was really impressive what he was able to do at Purdue. And he's doing it for the for Detroit here, flying around, bringing guys to the ground. Needs to better understand the game and, and coverage and all that stuff, uh, gap discipline, you name it. He's like a poor man's Micah Parsons, though, and doing a similar thing for Detroit. And then Jerry Jacobs, again, nothing crazy, but a low-level corner comes in and isn't a liability. He's going to get some respect. So that's, that's Jerry Jacobs, uh, who I think is an undrafted rookie. He certainly was, whether it was this year or last year, but 
six foot, 200 pounds. He's got some size. There could be something there. We'll continue to see how he plays as the season goes on. Okay, the Green Bay Packers. So I did that film room on Jordan Love, and I think people thought I was overly defending him or being, um, you know, giving him too much benefit of the doubt. I think people just chose to focus in on the moments where I did explain away some of the stuff. The reality is he, he, he didn't play well, and I have high expectations from Jordan Love. Um, he didn't, I don't think he played miserably. I don't think you write him off or anything, but I am going to lower him because I thought that he would show a lot more poise and just kind of in general chemistry with the receivers, uh, ability to run the offense. Really what came down for Jordan Love, if you want to talk about his Madden rating here, is the awareness trait where he clearly just needs to work with the ones. He needs to understand the offense. He needs to develop his chemistry with his receivers. He needs to better recognize the blitz. All of that really hurt him against the Chiefs, as did Royce Newman, who had one of the worst offensive line performances of the season, had Jordan Love running for his life pretty much the entire game. So yes, the Chiefs game was his worst on the season, but it's not like he's been a strength for this offensive line. I hated this pick when the Packers made it. I had a seventh round grade on Royce Newman, and I think he's played like a seventh round tackle should play at guard, which is below level production. He's been kind of forced into action here, um, but as soon as Bakhtiari's back in about a week here, Elton Jenkins, who's going to go up again after another elite performance at left tackle, slides in at left guard, and then he kicked John Runyon over to right guard, and this offensive line gets significantly upgraded. Your left tackle gets better, your left guard gets better, and your right guard gets significantly better. <laughs> Just getting Royce Newman out of there. So um, there's the offense, uh, actually... Um, Dominique Daphne is also going to go up the H back, uh, getting some more opportunities due to the unfortunate injury to Robert Tanyan, but uh, blocking well for the Packers. But then on defense, Jonathan Garvin playing that 3-4 hybrid rotational third edge off the bench that we keep talking about throughout this episode um, under the Vic Fangio style of 3-4 outside linebackers, just kind of that do-it-all rotational piece. It's been a nice find for the Packers. And then deep breaths, believe it or not, Kevin freaking King playing good football for the Green Bay Packers. Could have played even better football, let yet another interception go right through his bare mitts. Um, but it was good coverage on that play, so a little give and take. Uh, but at the end of the day, Kevin King is playing some of his best football right now. Is that just cornerback variance and he's happened to be in the right place at the right time? Or is Kevin King actually okay now? I don't know. I would say it's probably just a, a decent run of luck for him. I'm assuming he's going to go back to just getting obliterated. Um, but credit where credit's due. He's playing well the last couple weeks. He's going to go up. We'll see how sustainable that is. Okay, the Carolina Panthers. It's been bad. Uh, it's been real bad, but they have found a couple of offensive linemen kind of out of nowhere here that have been okay. So Sam Tecklenburg gets the start at center with Matt Paradise going down for the season and held his own. So could be something there. We'll see. He's from Baylor. We know Matt Rule loves to go to his college guys, and here's another one. Um, but maybe a fine there. We'll see. I think the guy's like 290 pounds, which is fascinating. And then Michael Jordan, the uh, villain of the Cincinnati Bengals, the guy that led to Joe Burrow's ACL injury with, you know, being a player that I said was actually the worst player in the NFL last year because he hurt his team the most out of any player being terrible. And then that terrible play leading to the Bengals quarterback tearing his ACL, I think was grounds for saying he was the worst player in the NFL last year. But he is a good athlete out of Ohio State. Sometimes these linemen just need some time. I don't think Michael Jordan's going to turn around and be a starting guard all of a sudden, but uh, he has been out there for the Panthers and has looked decent. So we'll leave it at that. We'll continue to see how he plays moving forward. I will say Robbie Anderson can he continues to really suck this year. I mean, he has been a borderline liability for them, dropping balls, not coming down with contested car uh, targets, not creating the same separation. Uh, you know, Pan Panthers fans are really championing what Robbie Anderson is going to be now that Cam Newton is gonna be back. I'm not so sure, man. I don't know what Cam Newton is gonna to do to make Robbie Anderson start playing physical football uh, and stop dropping footballs. I, I, 
I don't know uh, if that's going to change anything. I, I think that's unrelated to Sam Darnold throwing interceptions, honestly. Um, so Robbie Anderson really struggling. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Hassan Reddick just continues to be used so well here. His run and chase ability is just so elite. Very, very similar player, honestly, to Micah Parsons uh, at this point in time. Ironically, they're both 79 overalls, but both guys just lightning fast, fly to the ball, and um, are just headaches for defenses because they kind of line up all over the place and uh, come in with a ton of speed and effort. So that's Hassan Reddick. And then Keith Taylor, plus one, stepping up at corner. Uh, it's interesting that he's still getting more playing time than Stefan Gilmore. I, I don't think that lasts because Gilmore is playing really well since he's come in here. But they, they do like what they have in Keith Taylor. He's a rookie out of Washington with a ton of length and physicality, so he's been good for them. Like I've said, Matt Rule has done a really great job with this defense and finding players, and that hasn't changed. But then we got the Patriots. So offensively, Jacob Johnson. I don't know if, if it's Jacob or Jacob, but I like saying Jacob. So we're going to go Jacob. Uh, plus five, 65 to a 70. He's been a mauling fullback. They use him a ton. So he's going up. And then Inkeel Harry. The Kevin Kings and Inkeel Harrys are going up this week. Uh, the Michael Jordans are going up this week. A good week for bad football players as Inkeel Harry has gotten some targets and been a part of the offense the last couple weeks. Former first round pick, you better do that. Um, we'll see if, if this is an anomaly or if he's figured some stuff out, uh, but plus one for now. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Christian Barmore. I don't know why the NFL let Bill Belichick get his hands on Christian Barmore. Uh, not the least bit surprised to see his pressure numbers and his playing time go up and up and up as his season has gone on. This dude is very Chris Jones-esque. His explosiveness, his power off the ball. I think NFL teams really overthought this on Christian Barmore. He was the only option in this draft class if you wanted a quality defensive tackle, um, at least one that can rush the passer right away. And the Patriots got that in Christian Barmore. So he's been a, an underrated piece to that defense. He's not consistent. He's not a great run defender. But, you know, three, four, five times a game, he is obliterating pockets with his power and his get off. And Bill Belichick is really leaning on that. And Matthew Judon as well has been a great addition to this defense. So, um, and, and Miles Bryant as well, uh, starting in the slot. So, you know, you lose a Stephon Gilmore. But you add in a Barmore, a Matthew Judon, a Miles Bryant, Bill Belichick making this defense better in other ways than just having elite coverage. They're running more zone, uh, but they're getting more pass rush up front thanks to having better players. So Bill Belichick, just as Bill Belichick has done for 20 plus years here in New England, crafting his defense around his best players. And he's doing such a good job of that. And Adrian Phillips as well, kind of fending off Kyle Duggar in, in a lot of ways. Now they use both these players a ton, but Adrian Phillips has been their best safety this season. Uh, one of their best cover players in general uh, as that kind of hybrid box defender, if you will. All right, the Las Vegas Raiders, just three players on the offensive line. The rest of this team is faltering a little bit right now, but Andre James, the project at center. It's really funny, you know, this is almost like John Gruden's dying wish as he resigns. He swore by Andre James to the chagrin of many analysts, myself included, who said, why did you extend him? Why is he playing? He's never been good. He's out of nowhere. Uh, but all of a sudden Gruden is gone and Andre James is like playing like a starting caliber center. It's, it's almost hilarious when you think about it, um, that maybe Gruden was right. Maybe Andre James just need, did need a little bit more time, uh, but he's playing really good football. Colton Miller, honestly, as I've said, week after week after week, just something Derek Carr does not have to forget about being his blind side. And that's a huge deal for a quarterback in Derek Carr that just, he's not this elite play extender, at least from a pocket presence point of mind. Um, you know, he doesn't have that eye in the back of his head. So to have Colt Miller just protecting that blind side snap after snap, after snap, after snap, after snap, so valuable. He is entering David Bakhtiari territory. Um, if nothing else, he's entering Laramie Tunsil territory as an elite pass protecting left tackle. Then John Simpson, more of a run blocking boost here for the left guard, but uh, second year player out of Clemson. He's got some strength. He can move some people in the run game. All right, the LA Rams, big boosts this week, none of which being 
adding Odell Beckham and Von Miller, but they are coming into the picture here, which is just crazy. So on the offensive line, Brian Allen as a run blocker is going to be going up this week. And then Joseph Noteboom, week eight, I believe it was, got the start at left tackle. And he's a player that played a ton of snaps uh, over the last couple of years, and he's been okay. So he's a nice sixth piece for the Rams to have. Then on the defensive side of the ball, Greg freaking Gr uh, Gaines, man. Um, I just want to say that the Rams, they are, you can applaud so many things about this team, but if if you're going to trade away all these first round picks, you got to hit on fourth round picks, fifth round six uh, picks, sixth round picks. And they do that better than pretty much anybody. And some of the players going up here are those picks. Greg Gaines, Jordan Fuller. You know, they can't afford to keep a uh, 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 Michael Brockers up front. Well, it doesn't matter. They found Greg Gaines in the fourth round. They can't afford to keep John Johnson. It doesn't matter. They let Jordan Fuller go, who might be even better. Sixth round pick, fourth round pick. Ernest Jones, a mid-round pick at linebacker, stepping up. Agbanya, Akaronkwo, stepping up like... The Rams are so effing good at getting fifth round picks, sixth round picks to look like second round picks, first round picks. In the case of Jordan Fuller, who's been lights out as that hybrid safety. So just not enough hats to tip towards the Rams. Sean McVay, Les Snead. Is, is Les Snead the best general manager in the NFL? He might be because anybody can be aggressive and trade away first round picks and get Odell Beckham to sign uh, to your team for a league minimum contract. Uh, that, that stuff's easy. Trade for Matthew Stafford. That stuff's easy. But there is a flip side that needs to be accomplished when you do that. And it's unbelievably impressive that they hit on some of these guys, um, Dante Dion included. Um, but also some more big name players, Ashawn Robinson, Leonard Floyd, it's, it's the Aaron Donald effect, let's be honest, but these are talented players. Uh, so Leonard Floyd is, has been getting after the quarterback really well. Again, I think that is the Aaron Donald effect, but he's going to go up due to that. Uh, and then Ashawn Robinson, um, I think he's had some questions about his motor throughout his career, but he is really playing good run defense lately. So all across the board, just positivity for the Rams right now. If they don't win a Super Bowl this year, it is going to be a massive disappointment. Then the Baltimore Ravens, no Thursday night football included, though we could be seeing a drop to Lamar Jackson after that performance. But just week nine here, and some of these big body blockers up front, Eric Tomlinson and Patrick Ricard. Uh, Tomlinson, it's going to be interesting when Boyle comes back here because Tomlinson has emerged as, as a comparable level blocker up front for them, which is Boyle's job, but they could have two of those guys now, which is pretty cool. And Patrick Ricard as well. He's been blocking his ass off, but against the Vikings, he had an entire drive that was his in the receiving game. Catching the ball in the flat, and then at 300 pounds, the ability to show the fluidity to get up field, fight for yardage, and even just turn around and catch the ball at that size is not easy a special athlete and a remarkable job by the Ravens to convert a 300 pound defensive tackle into the second best fullback in the NFL. Uh, then we got the New Orleans Saints. So offensively, Trevor Simeon going to go up four from 58 to a 62. He looks fine. Looks like a high level backup. Deontay Harris, my dude, five foot seven, but an ultra route runner, good pair of hands, explosive as all hell after the catch. Big fan of Deontay Harris's game. One of my more global macro takes this year has truly surfaced in that the modern NFL is really waking up to the fact that you don't need to be six feet two to be a good receiver. If you have a well-timed offense with a receiver that can create separation and just doesn't drop the ball, that's a very valuable player to your team. And Deontay Harris with the Saints, with Sean Payton, is proving that to the highest level. But there's a lot of guys around the league, and we've had a couple of them in this episode going up, like uh, Olamide Zacchaeus. Uh, but Kenny Stills, more of that traditional deep threat, doing his job as a veteran signing here. And James Hurst continues to climb at guard now. This dude is so versatile. He's a great pass protector. I'm a big fan of James Hurst. I think he gives the Saints an option at left tackle if they can't make it work with Teron Armstead long term. Hurst is actually younger than Teron Armstead. He's been in the league for a while, but he's always played well. 
at least over the last three or four years when they call his number, whether it's the Saints or the Ravens. So uh, people who are studs and duds viewers, I think your time will come to be able to flaunt to your friends when James Hurst gets $40 million, $35 million after this season, whether it's from the Saints or someone else, you'll be able to flaunt to your friends and say, um, I knew this was coming when people on Twitter are gonna be saying, holy overpay. No, James Hurst is worth it. He is sweet. And now he's versatile. He can play guard and tackle. And then we got um, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. He's just having a very good season. He's kind of a boomer bust cover player. He's a risk taker, but there is value in that. So he, he will get beat, but he makes plays and uh, just kind of flies around the field. I, I like Chauncey Gardner-Johnson a lot. I think he offers a, a special asset to the Saints defense that's really good. Okay, then we got the Seattle Seahawks. Geno Smith gonna get some respect for the job he did stepping in with Russ's injury. Just looked like a high level backup. And you know, I don't think he'll ever get a starting opportunity in the NFL, but he has value as a good backup that could uh, you know, help this team get some wins. He played really well against the Jags and, and contributed to them winning that game. And then you got Sidney Jones in the revenge game against the Jags playing really good football. Uh, but it just made, made sense when they brought him in. He's from Washington and he's just a good scheme fit. He's, he's got length and he's settled in as a good corner for the Seahawks. It was a nice trade to go and get him. It took a little bit of time for him to get familiar here, but he, he's been a nice, a nice addition. And then Ryan Neal, he's been a decent kind of rotational third safety that's been a good run defender, a good kind of intermediate uh, slot defender of, of sorts. So he's going to go up as well. Now we got the Pittsburgh Steelers kind of figuring out their identity offensively over the last couple of weeks. Najee Harris, Deontay Johnson, Pat Fryermuth. That's really it. I mean, a little bit of Chase Claypool as well, but it's just Big Ben saying, hey, make a play for me. Hand the ball off to Najee Harris, throw a fade to Pat Fryermuth, let Deontay Johnson thrive after the catch and, and utilize his quick separation ability. And these guys are stepping up. So those three notable going up. And then Zach Gentry's been their third tight end, but he's been a good blocker. He's come down with some tough catches. The dude's like eight feet tall, so that's nice. Uh, but yeah, the Steelers getting some nice offensive weapons to step up. Uh, and then the offensive line, some good, some bad on the left side there. Dan Moore, uh, man, it, I, I didn't understand this pick when they made it. I gave the Steelers the benefit of the doubt, but it just... He's not very good. He shouldn't be starting at this point. He's clearly got some talent and could get there, uh, but he, he had a, an embarrassing week nine against, or uh, sorry, week eight against Miles Garrett. Granted against Miles Garrett, but a pass block grade of zero in that game. Yes, zero pass block grade by PFF. Uh, and it showed on the film. Uh, but Kevin Dotson plus 174 to 75. Just been very stable as a pass protector ever since he came into the pick, uh, came into the, uh, NFL as a uh, shockingly good fourth round pick. And then Cam Hayward, he is matching Aaron Donald uh, really week to week as far as pressure numbers, run defense, the impact he's had on the game. He's been unbelievably good. Uh, TJ Watt gets the spotlight, but Cam Hayward is just as important to this Steelers defense. So he's going up 92 to a 93. And then we've got the Houston Texans. So I'm actually starting to have a little bit of fun with the at least the studs and duds portion of the Texans. You know, offensively, it's whatever. Nico Collins is, is playing nice for a rookie, as is Brevin Jordan, who had a uh, touchdown against... Uh, ooh, who was it that they had that garbage time against? I'm already forgetting uh, for the Texans. Um, the, it was a good team. Three hours later. Rams. Rams it was. But yeah, interesting young players. We'll, we'll see how they grow. Jerron Christian's also fun. I mean, he was a third round pick from Washington, obviously a crowded group that he wasn't able to make the team there, um, but hasn't really gotten a chance to prove his worth. He's still young. He's like 24 years old out of Louisville. He's got some length at six foot five, some athleticism. He's been starting at left tackle and, and playing really good football. They could have found something there in Jerron Christian. So some interesting stuff on offense in the brewing because this is what this season is all about for the Texans, right? It's just find some diamond in the rough, some pieces to build around the next year. But then I look at this defense. The fun thing about this Texans team is it's been the same guys every week. And that's when you know that they're th these guys are legit. When you get the consistency that they're showing week after week, 
that's when you can start to get excited about some of these guys. So Ross Blacklock is really growing as the season's gone on, been much better against the run. This is an undersized defensive tackle. So you, you figured it might take a little bit of time when he got into the NFL, some time to uh, grow as a run defender, and he's doing that. Roy Lopez has been super consistent as that kind of Danny Shelton-esque block-eating nose tackle run defender up front. Jacob Martin's been very solid. That one's not quite as exciting, but Jonathan Greenard, no one talks about it because he's on the Houston Texans, but he's one of the, been one of the more pleasant surprises on the entire season. This guy is getting after the quarterback every single week. He's up to like seven sacks now, like 30 pressures, I think. Uh, he's got a little bit of size, a little bit of power. He has technique as a pass rusher. Um, but yeah, he's just been a really pleasant surprise. He's not a great athlete, but he does everything else so well that he's making the most of it. And I think he is a number two edge piece that they can build off as they head into next year. And then Tavier Thomas is also super fascinating. This is a small school, uh, shorter slot corner. He's at 5'10", which is you know, obviously a decent size, but I just don't think people were aware of Tavier Thomas, and he hasn't gotten those opportunities until now. Um, but this is a guy with real speed. He's got girth. You know, he's 200 pounds, 5'11", plays in the slot. He's tough. He tackles well. I think he's their slot corner. Now, the cost of that is they've moved Desmond King outside, where he has shown yet again that he needs to play in a zone-heavy slot corner system. They're playing Tavier Thomas, in the slot, I think for, for good reason. But I almost feel bad for Desmond King at this point because he couldn't control getting traded to Tennessee where they asked him to run a lot of man coverage out of the slot, which he's not good at. And then he comes here, presumably to play Tavier Thomas's role in that slot cover two, um, slot corner role in a lot of zone coverages. And they're like, nope, we need you to play outside. And he's getting just obliterated every week. So he's going to come down based on the role he plays in right now. But I still believe the second a team that runs a lot of either, you know, cover three or cover two wants to put him in the slot, he'll be good. Uh, again, he's super instinctive in those zone coverages when he can read the quarterback's eyes and see routes develop. But when he has to turn around and play on the outside, it's just really tough on him. Granted, it, it is a cover two heavy system. So when they go cover two, he's a little bit more comfortable there but he can't run cover two every single play. He does eventually have to flip around and um, turn his back to the quarterback, which he's just not comfortable doing. So he's going to come down for those reasons. Um, but then we got two teams left, the Tennessee Titans, a couple of really exciting weeks here, lots of movement in the positive direction. So on offense, A.J. Brown, just indefensible. He's got a couple of drops against the Rams, but uncharacteristic. I, I'm not looking too far into that. I think that's just fluky. He's been separating against the best of them over the middle of the field. His chemistry with Ryan Tannehill is so hard to defend, so he's going to go up. He continues to climb uh, the wide receiver ranks and discussion. And then Nick Westbrook-Akine, this guy is Alan Lazard for the you know Shanahan scheme here for the Titans. He's six foot three, he blocks his absolute butt off. Sure hands when they go his way, but uh, doesn't separate for the life of him. So unless he gets schemed open. So uh, he's going to go up too. I love his physicality, his run blocking. He's part H-back really with the way they use him, but he is an asset to this scheme. Then you have these two tight ends really stepping up. Both Michael Pruitt, who's in the Janu Smith mold of undersized speedy tight ends that can be a mismatch problem and a piece that's hard to to keep an eye on off of play action as he sneaks out of the line of scrimmage. And then Jeff Swaim, a little more of that traditional tight end, but utilized in similar ways. Uh, he's also going up. So those are, you know, some under the radar offensive weapons stepping up for the Titans with Derrick Henry now gone, which is really good to see. Bobby Hart, unfortunately, is starting at left tackle. Uh, he was another villain of Cincinnati along with um, Michael Jordan, unfortunately, Bobby Hart now playing left tackle. Absolute abysmal at that position against the Rams going down two. They got to get Taylor Lewan back ASAP because that would be a big problem for the Titans that have big expectations. Um, but that does seem likely. And then on the defensive side of the ball, this is where you've been really pleasant, pleasantly surprised by the Titans, right? Danico Autry going up one. He's been just a pocket-pushing specialist 
Uh, been a great signing for that Titans defense. He has unlocked some things for them, including Jeffrey Simmons and Harold Landry, who are playing great in their own right. But I think all of these guys complement each other so well. The, the, their ability really to be so flexible. All these guys are elite athletes for their relative position, right? Harold Landry, so much bend and quickness. Jeffrey Simmons, just the definition of an elite athlete for a defensive tackle. And Danico Autry is just, you know, he, he moves really well. He's got great get off, especially for a 280 pound dude. So they just cause a lot of problems. And you're seeing that, you know, they're not necessarily grading out super well alone. Uh, if you want to look at like PFF grades, but I, I do think when you watch these guys play the, the chaos that they're able to create for um, offensive lines with their power and get off and in Landry's case, his bend. Uh, and even Bud Dupree is another piece in this, this picture. Um, but we, we know Bud Dupree can do that. It's these other guys stepping up that's been so big for this defense. Um, but yeah, these guys just, they build off each other so well. And I love what Mike Vrabel has done and having the foresight to say this, you know, especially in Danico Autry's case, this is the missing piece that I need to create pressure for this team. And I heard that they already have as many sacks as they had last season. So this pass rush has been uh, just completely overhauled for the Titans, and you love to see it. We've got David, Lo David Long coming up for the second week in a row, stepping up at linebacker in that do-it-all role. And then in the secondary, I think these guys are benefiting from the pass rush, but these are talented players that are coming into their own as well. So... We've got a couple of young players here, three of them really, Elijah Molden, rookie slot corner, uh, doing exactly what I figured he would, which was going to be a starting caliber slot corner right away. I don't love his athleticism. I don't love his coverage ability, but it's fine, and I always said that. Uh, but I do love his instinctiveness, ability to make plays around the line of scrimmage. You're definitely seeing that transition to the NFL. And then with Chris Jackson, Playing on the outside, he was, a, I think, a seventh round pick out of Marshall, but he's got some speed. He's six feet. Uh, he has done such a great job of just stepping in when no one expected him to be able to do that due to these injuries on the outside with, um, obviously, Farley done for the season, but even then, Christian Fulton, it's been such an asset for Chris Jackson to step in as a seventh round, second year player and not be a liability and be a borderline strength for them. Uh, he, he's been, I think he's got a pass break up like five straight weeks or something. So he, he's been really nice. Amani Hooker as well. Big fan of Amani Hooker's game. Uh, making that full-time conversion to safety is a guy that was kind of that slot corner type of player. He's doing a little bit of everything, a little free safety, a little strong safety, um, but showing off the ball skills and the instincts as well as being a phenomenal tackler. So some young guys really stepping up. And then it also helps when Kevin Bayard re-emerges as the best safety in football period stamp it in lock it in he he was to me the best free safety in 2019 enter 2020 in a covid season where there was no pass rush in front of him and he was he went down to being kind of average but now he's got help around him and showing off the ability to be aggressive and create turnovers i love kevin byard man one of the more underrated players in the nfl uh, so hats off to Kevin Byard, officially, in my opinion, retaking the crown as the best safety in football. He's got five interceptions this season. His coverage grades are fantastic. He's been a better run defender than he ever has before. So really don't think there should be too much of a debate there with Kevin Byard at the top. Okay, final team here, Minnesota Vikings. A lot of weird players here. Moving up, we got Kane and Wangu, who really does this on special teams but a kick return touchdown where he shows off the unbelievable athleticism that got him drafted. You got to keep in mind, Kane was a bad running back for, I uh, for Iowa State. Showed very minimal flashes, and it's possible that this was just a fluky, flashy game from Kane and Wangu. But that said, they were in a fake punt as well with Kane, and he showed like vision, the ability to break tackles, I am intrigued, and I don't know what's going on with this Dalvin Cook situation. I hope, you know, he didn't do anything terrible and he can get back on the field for everyone's sake, but if he did, I'm kind of intrigued to see Kane and Wang Wu just get five, ten carries on offense, because I don't think he really got that many. <laughs> um, 
uh, for for them against the Ravens, but uh, what he showed on special teams was intriguing. And this guy is a top echelon athlete as far as his testing numbers go. So it's just fun to see that translate to the NFL football field. You know what else is fun to see translate to the NFL football field is a fullback named CJ Ham going ham in every aspect of the game this year. He, he's been very Kyle Juszczyk-esque, uh, dare I say, almost identical to a Kyle Juszczyk, uh, making plays in the receiving game down the field. They can hand him the ball as a former D3 running back. He's a local guy out of, uh, I think, um, oh, I should know this. I, I went to school down the street. I think it, I think it was Augustana, but I could be, could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, man, he's do-it-all fullback. He loves his responsibility as a blocker. He's not just a utility back who's decent as a blocker and decent as a receiver. No, he's like a damn good blocking fullback who also happens to have running back skills. He is a true asset to the Vikings and uh, they, they should do everything they can to uh, ensure he's here for a long time as a fan favorite and uh, a local guy and all that stuff. I can't remember if they paid him or not. Uh, Vikings fans can let me know in the comments down below. Uh, but then you also have Tyler Conklin, who's kind of emerged, I suppose, as this team's full-time starter at tight end. They traded for Herndon, and he hasn't been able to beat out Tyler Conklin. So it's it's really Ben Conklin, who is slow as hell, but he can catch the ball when he throw him his way. He's blocking well. He's got a good pair of hands, so he's fine. I think they would love to have more explosiveness at that position. Um, but with Irv Smith out and Herndon not being able to play that role and the guy they drafted, um, the freak athlete, not really doing anything as a rookie. They've had to lean on Conklin and he's he's stepped up. And then Mason Cole gets the start at center and plays solid. A player they traded for from Arizona. The Cardinals didn't have room for him on their roster and the Vikings did because their offensive line sucks. Uh, but uh, he came in and actually gave them some of the best pass protection against the Ravens that they've gotten from the center position in a while. Uh, not the run blocker, uh, run blocker that Bradbury is, but uh, good pass pro game from Mason Cole. Okay, and then in the secondary, Cameron Bynum with a plus three this week and watching him against the Ravens, I was like, this just makes sense. He was a you know lengthy zone corner for the California Golden Bears. Really smart guy, instinctive player, a tough player. Really good understanding of the game, and he made some beautiful interceptions. Really good ball skills for the Bears, but uh, the California Bears. But the problem is this dude is slow. He has like legit four six speed, so he falls in the draft and has to make the conversion to safety. But he gets a full time kind of starting reps this week because uh, Harrison Smith was out with COVID protocols and he balls out. Great interception and just all around good play. Tackles well. Super impressed by Cam Bynum. This, this just made sense. And I'm excited to see him continue to grow. I, I don't know if Zimmer's gonna be here next year, but the scheme is perfect. I mean, Zimmer asks a ton of versatility from these safeties and who better than an actual converted cornerback. Um, but Xavier Woods has also been a great uh, scheme fit there as well. You know, Xavier Woods is a guy that has played a lot of slot corner for a team like Dallas. So he has that similar ability to uh, convert into man coverage, uh, even run man coverage straight up and like cover one. Uh, but yeah, Bynum and Woods have been really pleasant surprise for Zimmer and this defense. And that is going to do it for Studs and Duds this week. I really hope you guys enjoyed. Do let me know in the comments down below where you agree, where you disagree, and if there's any players you feel I missed. Also, please do hit that like button down below. Consider checking out those links to support the channel financially. I really appreciate you. And make sure you subscribe for more NFL content as we move forward. So appreciate you all for watching, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.